have not figured it out yet, we are in John 21. We are going to wrap up our series in John, 85 weeks. I hope that through our study, you have learned, you have grown in faith, you have a better grasp of who Jesus is, why he came to earth, what he did, what he accomplished. I know that I have learned a lot, and I pray and I hope that you have as well. I've seen things that I have not seen before. It's been a fun journey, and I'm looking forward to what's next. But before we do that, let's pray and finish up the Gospel of John. God, we are grateful for you. We are grateful that you are the one who took on flesh and dwelt among us, that you came to earth, that you accomplished what we could not accomplish on our own. God, may we love you more when we leave than we did when we walked in because we know you more. Amen. So last week, we left off with Jesus telling Peter that he would one day be crucified. But again, imagine knowing that you'll know how you die, you just don't know when. Imagine knowing, not just that you would know how you die, but knowing that you would be executed for your faith. You just don't know when. It's going to happen. You just don't know when it's going to happen. How would you respond? Would you be looking over your shoulder every day for the rest of your life, wondering if today's the day? Right, this, this really sets the stage for, for today, for the interaction that, that Jesus and Peter have. Imagine, as we go forward, that Jesus is talking to you. Because these are the very same questions, the very same interaction that Jesus had with Peter, he has with us every day of our lives. Peter, you're going to be crucified. Well, at some point after this, Peter and Jesus go on a walk. Maybe it was during the end of the previous conversation. John doesn't tell us, but we know that at this point they're, they're going on a walk. Peter is is playing in his mind the fact that he's going to be crucified. And he looks back and he sees John following them. What about him? I'm going to be crucified, but, but what about him? This is a response that we have all had in life. It's something that, that we have all wondered about. It's something that we have all struggled with. Think about it in our daily scenarios. And, and as was already said, if you have more than one child, you know this question. If you had a sibling, you know this question. It's not fair. What about? Um, pick up your cup that you left on the floor. Well, what about this cup over here that's not mine? Right, this, these are actual conversations that have happened in my house. You may be surprised. We all know what this is like. If you had siblings, you know these questions as well. Like this is, it, and you know the appropriate response. Mind your own business. Just do what you're told. I mean, but think about it in life. Because we have the same questions in life. Jesus, why do I have cancer? Why does my wife have cancer? Why are my loved ones suffering? Why don't they know you, Jesus? Why are there hurricanes that happen that destroy property and kill people? Why do those people have more money than I do? I would be much more faithful, I'm certain, than they would be. And yet, God, you have given them more. I mean, the list goes on and on. You can, you can come up with a million different scenarios of questions that you would have. 
And Jesus' response is that of a parent, or a parent's response is, is what Jesus said. Mind your own business, Peter. What's it matter to you if I decide that John remains until the end, until I return? Remember that that Peter and John had a very close relationship. They were both in the inner circle. They they not only were with Jesus for three years, but they were with Jesus in the the very inner circle. They saw him transfigured on the mountain. They saw him praying in the garden. They saw things that the other disciples didn't have. They were interconnected with who Jesus was and what he did. They saw things in his ministry that others didn't see. Peter and John were very close. And Peter's question on its face is reasonable, isn't it? It's a very reasonable question. They're very close. They know Jesus. Jesus knows the future. Peter, you're going to be crucified. All right, well, I'm going to be crucified. What's going to happen to him? Peter, mind your own business. See, it's a reasonable question, but the fact that it's reasonable does not make it right or good. We are capable of talking ourselves and justifying all kinds of actions. We can make all kinds of things reasonable, justifiable, but that doesn't make them right I mean, how many times are we able to justify our lack of faith as reasonable? How many times are we able to turn our attention off of God and what He has for us and on to something else? How often do we look away from God and call it reasonable and justify it? I recently had the opportunity to walk with parents or loved ones through difficult times. It's an, it's an honor to do this, but it's also a burden. I mean, think about the fact that we know that God is good. The Bible is very clear. God is good. And yet sometimes, because of our lack of understanding, our lack of, of being able to see clearly, We look at events in this world or in our lives, and they cloud God's goodness. I have a hard time seeing God's goodness in certain scenarios. There are times when the storms in the life, in our lives, make seeing God's goodness almost impossible. And this is why Jesus' response to Peter is so important. We know that God is sovereign over all things. This is undisputed. There is no question that God is sovereign over all things. The Bible makes this very clear. And yet, there are many people, even Christians, who try to take God's sovereignty out of the equation. They try to deflect the issue and say that God is not sovereign over everything. Because they can't grasp why God would allow bad things to happen. Why would God allow a young, healthy family to be killed in a car accident? Why would God allow a baby to be killed in a fire? Why would God allow? The list goes on and on. And some people have a hard time dealing with this, so they claim that God couldn't stop it. That God would stop it if he could have, but he couldn't. This is wrong and it's blasphemy. So what is the answer? The answer is, I don't know. As I did the funeral for the one-month-old who was killed in a fire, my response to them was, I don't know why this happened. I can't tell you why this happened. I, people expect a pastor to stand up and give reasons. I can't do that because I don't know We can't see the big picture. We can't comprehend with our finite minds why God does what he does and why he allows what he allows. What we do know is God allows all that happens. And it doesn't always make sense to us. 
Yet we also know that the Bible tells us that God is good and all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. We, we know this and we believe this and somehow God is glorified in all things. All things. Things that we may not even begin to comprehend in this world. How God could be glorified in such things. What does this have to do with Peter's question and Jesus' answer? Turn in your Bibles, if you have them, to, John, or to Psalm 139. And put a marker in here. I'm going to read one verse in Psalm 139. But you, at some point, read the whole thing. It is an amazing psalm. Psalm 139. I'm going to read verse 16. And again, at some point today or this week, read the whole psalm. But here's what it says in verse 16. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. God, you knew me before I was born. God, you were there before I was born. God is is infinite. He is is across time. He He knew every one of my days before I was born. In your book were written every one of my days. God is there in it, in our suffering, in our weeping, in our crying, in our pain, in our suffering, in our joy, in our happiness. He is there, and they were all written, every one of them. Your days were written by God before you were born. Now, this does not mean that God simply wound you up, and he has decided everything that you were going to do, and then you're just a robot going through life. We, we know that we live and we make choices and we choose to obey or disobey. We know that we have choices that we make. We live our lives and we choose to follow or we choose to do certain things. Yet God is not surprised by our actions, by our choices, by the things that happen to us outside of our control. The problem is we don't understand how these two things work together. How is God sovereign over all things? How has he written every day of our lives and yet we still have choices? The answer is, I don't know. I can't comprehend it. It makes no sense to me. But we know that's what the Bible tells us. And so we trust. I mean, we have seen this throughout John where people do certain things and we know that it's, it's done in their free choices, but they do it to fulfill God's purposes and his plan. We know that that the Sanhedrin did what they did. And what they did was chosen for them to do ahead of time, and yet it was their own choice. We don't know how this works. So some of you are sitting there, and you're thinking, okay, but how how can I do this, right? I mean, how can I I trust? So Peter is told, you're going to be crucified. How is Peter able to live every day the rest of his life knowing what's coming? How can Peter live knowing what's going on? How can we we continue to walk in faith as difficult times, as difficult things happen? Turn a few chapters to your left to Psalm 119. Don't worry, we're not going to read the whole chapter. But turn to verse 105. This is one of the most comforting and frustrating verses in the entire Bible. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. How can I live each day, God, knowing that you are sovereign over all things, even when bad things happen, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path? How many times have you used a lamp? I mean, in our day and age, we, most of us probably don't carry lanterns around with us. But what about, what about your cell phone light? Right? That's not a very powerful light, but it lights up. That's like a light. It's like a lamp. I mean, it is a light. It's like a lamp where it, it, um, it lights up the area around you. Notice it doesn't say your word is a flashlight or your word is a headlight or your word 
shines forward and shows us where we're going. No, it says, it's a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. His word illumines each step that we are to take. As you have a lamp, you're walking, each step is illuminated. You know where you're going to go each step. You can't get too far ahead. If you start running with a lamp, you're going to trip and you're going to fall. One step at a time is what it lights up. We are to take one step at a time. One day at a time. And sometimes that's too much. One moment at a time. See, the difference between us and Peter is that Peter was told ahead of time what's going to happen to him. He was, he was not given details. He, Jesus didn't say, Peter, on August 31st of A.D. 60, you're going to be arrested, and then the next day you're... No, he didn't say that. He just said, Peter, you're going to stretch out your arms, and you're going to go where you don't want to go. He didn't say, Peter, I'm telling you this now, so that way when it happens, you'll be looking forward to it. No, you're not going to want to go there. One step at a time. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. One step at a time. Peter, you're going to be crucified. What about him? Peter, don't worry about him. You follow me. The word you is emphatic. He's almost yelling, Peter, you follow me. It doesn't matter what John does or what I have in store for John. What you are to be concerned about is you. You know, Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow has enough worries of its own. The same could be said here. Peter, don't worry about John. John has enough trouble of his own. You worry about Peter. You focus on yourself. Jesus understands that if we take our eyes off of him, then we will fall. If we take our eyes off of who Jesus is and start wondering about other people, we will fall. We will stumble. Comparison is a dangerous game to play when we're walking on the path. You're walking on the path. Each step is lit up. What happens when you start looking away? Well, I'm, wondering, I'm worried about him, but I'm still walking. I'm going to trip and I'm going to fall. I'm going to move. Something's going to happen because I'm not watching where I'm going. Each step, I keep my eyes before me. Think about driving. One of the things that you, you teach young drivers is that they need to keep their eyes on the road. Because what happens? You're driving, you look over, and your car starts to drift where you're looking. The same thing is in our faith. When we take our eyes off of Jesus and put them on somebody else, we start to drift. We start to turn. We start to go where we're not supposed to go. Hebrews 11 is a chapter full of people of great faith. These are people who were faithful, faithful Old Testament saints who lived the life that they were supposed to live, mostly. None are perfect. And yet they all looked forward to the city whose founder and builder is God. They knew that they were living for something else, not for this world. And so these people are, are amazing stories of faith. And yet Hebrews 12 does not say, because we're surrounded by such great cloud of witnesses, look to the witnesses to remain firm in faith. No, it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so many by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. What do you do when you receive bad news, you look to Jesus. What do you do when bad things happen? You look to Jesus. What do you do when there are terrible things going on or a tragedy strikes? You look to Jesus. It may seem too simple 
of an answer, but it is the answer. He is the answer. Notice Jesus did not come into the world to give us answers to our problems. He came to be the answer to our problems. This is the life that we are to live. It's not an easy life. It's hard. It's full of difficulties. What do you do? You look to Jesus. We can never understand why things happen. But we know the one who does. And we trust him. So often when things happen, we stop and we start looking and focusing on the problem, wondering why it's happening. And we try to figure out what's the reason this is happening. As if it's directly related to who we are or we have control or I mean, sometimes, to be frankly, it, it is just because we do stupid things, and as a result, things happen to us. But there are times where we, we get a cancer diagnosis, and so we sit there and say, all right, well, what am I supposed to learn? How am I supposed to get through this? What? No, you look to Jesus. Stop looking at the cancer. Stop looking at the bad news. Stop dwelling in the, the rut. Look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. John ends with a parenthetical, or I should say next is a parenthetical, and he clarifies here. And I, I think this is really funny. Like when I, when I read this, it causes me to chuckle because Jesus says, hey, what's it to you if I say that he should live until I return? And then this rumor spread. John's not going to die. John's not going to die until Jesus comes back. So the older John gets, what do you think the, the thought is? Oh, we're in the last days. Oh, John's getting really old. He's not going to die until Jesus comes back. So John has to make sure he writes out, this isn't what he said. He didn't say I'm going to live forever. He didn't say I'm going to live until he comes back. He said, what's it to you if I do? Why is this important? Because have you ever believed something that's not in the Bible, but you thought it was? Have you ever taught something that's not in the Bible, but you thought it was? God helps those who help themselves. I mean, that, that's one of the things that I have been taught that was biblical, that is actually the opposite of biblical. Where we have these things that we think... Um, God can never give you more than you can handle. That is also something that is not in the Bible and is contrary to actually what the Bible tells us. Do you think Peter was able to handle his crucifixion? No, and so we, we have this thing where we teach, we can teach things that are not biblical, but then when the things happen, what if John, when John dies, if people believe that Jesus said he would live until Jesus returned and then John dies, what does that mean? That Jesus was a liar? That Jesus didn't know? But we have to be careful to teach what Scripture says and not what we want it to say or not what we think it says, but we have to teach what it says. Because then when things happen that are contrary to what we teach, we're wrong, not Scripture. But if we elevate our teaching to the level of Scripture, then we have a serious problem. And we create stumbling blocks of faith. And so John is sure to, to clarify what's going on. This gospel ends with a hyperbole. John wrote down some of what Jesus did. All right, we talked about this at the very beginning. John picked and he chose what things he wanted to write and what things he didn't want to write. I mean, think about the fact that Jesus' ministry was, was three plus years. And in these three years, we have, in all of the Gospels, maybe two weeks' worth of things. It's a very short amount of time that we're given of what Jesus actually did. Things were chosen by the Holy Spirit through the authors of the Gospels to write what they wrote. Why? Well, John tells us in chapter 20. So that we would believe that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing we would have life in his name. That's the purpose. The question is, do you believe? Your life, 
and your eternity depend on it. This has been a message from the chapel. Thanks for joining us today. For more information about the chapel or any of our campuses, including Akron, Green, Wadsworth, Kenmore, Cuyahoga Falls, and Nordonia, please go to our website at thechapel.life.